Hey, Dr. Rick Wallace, the following segment is brought to you by Inbox Dollars. Inbox Dollars is actually something that I used a long time ago when things got really hectic and I needed some income to steady me until I recovered and got some things done. Uh, you're not going to get rich by it, but if you're looking to make some extra money, Inbox Dollars is exactly what you need to check out. Look, you can get paid for taking surveys, opening emails. Uh, and a bunch of other different things. The link to find out how you can do all of this is in the box. It's free to find out, free to sign up. Check it out. I'm out of here. Hello, good afternoon. Welcome, welcome to our community town hall. I am your host, Tony Lindsay, and once again, I'm here. Uh, I'd like to thank you guys for joining us. And you know, we all know at the community town hall, this is where your voice matters. We, I've created this platform as a sort of a voice for the people because quite often we, uh, we see so much going on and so many people who tend to be speaking on our behalf in the mainstream media and other platforms. And I created this platform so that we can get some form of representation of, or, or a more authentic representation of the things that we truly care about and the things that affect us directly in our lives. So with that being said, I really I want to welcome these brilliant brothers to the show today. Uh, first, I would like to introduce to you all Dr. Rick Wallace. He is a leading life and business strategist and the founder of the Odyssey Project and the, Vision the Visionetics Institute. He's also the author of 24 books, including Born in Captivity, Psychopathology as a Legacy of Slavery and Undoing the African-American Mind. You've seen him on Dr. Boyce Watkins' Black Boss channel. Uh, he's a recurring contributor on the Sunrise Project, which is sponsored by the OWN Network. Uh, he's also the host of two radio shows, The Black Voice Reloaded Radio and The Teachers with Dr. Michael K. Blanchard, starting tomorrow at 9 a.m. Central Standard Time. So welcome, brother. Brother Wallace, I appreciate you being here today. Uh, it's an honor. Uh, and I just want to thank you for uh, bringing uh, Dr. Uh, Monago and myself together. I actually uh, have looked into him. Dr. Blanchard and I are constantly discussing his perspectives. And one of the things that uh, I pride myself in as a learner, uh, most people who consider themselves intellect intellectuals consider themselves to be teachers. I consider myself to be a learner. So I'm always looking for people to learn from. Uh, I'm always open to new ideas beyond those I hold myself. The moment your mind becomes closed, you can't learn. And I have followed this brother for a while. So the honor is actually mine to be here in a situation where we get to talk about something that I think we're both passionate about. Amen. All right. And I guess without further ado, my next guest, uh, you've probably seen him on various mainstream media networks like BET, TV One, Fox News, C-SPAN, NBC, also alter alternative media platforms like uh, the Black News Channel and Roland Martin's Unfiltered. He's a regular on that show. Uh, Dr. Cleo Monago is a behavioral health and cultural analyst, a writer, educator, uh, popular speaker, and Black African social justice and defense-focused human rights activist. He is the founder and CEO of the 
AMASSI Centers for Black Wellness and Culture and the founder of Black Men's Exchange National, BMX, where he's also the chief advisor. His uniquely thoughtful perspectives, they've been featured in numerous journals, including the Black Scholar, Journal of Black Studies and Research, the Journal of Black P Psychology, and the American Journal of Public Health. Uh, he's also the developer of the critically noted critical thinking and cultural affirmation methodology, a racism, oppression, trauma, trance breaking behavioral intervention. And that's something that I, I, I look forward to getting into you uh, with as well. So welcome, uh, Brother Minago. It's, 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 it's an honor to uh, have you on here today. It's an honor to be invited. Thank you, and it's an honor to be with you. And it's definitely an honor to be with Dr. Rick as well. Uh, you were writing, talking about all his books. I was like, damn, damn, damn. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because all those titles resonated with my with, with things that concern me as well. So I got to get all twenty seven if I can afford it. But anyway, <laughs> we, we'll <laughs> make that I'm, happen. We'll make that happen. Don't worry about it. Cool. Excellent. Good. Okay. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm honored to be here. All right, Absolutely. thank you. Now, the, the title of this uh, panel that we have today is Breaking the Chains of Codependency to Whiteness. And I know that sounds like a provocative uh, uh, title there, but I think it's, it's something that's very uh, important for us to discuss. It's a very necessary conversation. Um, now, what prompted this uh, live today was uh, I saw a tweet, um, not a tweet, I'm sorry, it was a Facebook post that was shared by actor, actually Dr. Wallace. And it was a quote from you, so I just like would like to share it with everyone. It says, you know who resents black people who refuse to comply with the system more than anyone else? Black people. There are people very uncomfortable with and resentful of blacks not adaptive or codependent to whiteness. And many of them are black. And uh, wow, that, that really hit me <laughs> in the feelers there. So I'd like you, if you could elaborate a little bit more on what you meant in the, in, as it pertains to the, the, um, the, the, this codependency to whiteness that we've often heard discussed, but not really enough or thoroughly explained. Well, one of the limitations of um, social media is you need to be brief and to the point to get people to actually take a listen to what you say. If you go on too long, that you might you might lose people. And one of the one of the misgivings I have about that quote is that it's not fully in context. Mm. Um, black people are codependent to whiteness, not not because of some kind of genetic inferiority complex. I mean, we at this late stage in our generational time here, we only know whiteness. That's our frame of reference. Um, unlike Asians and Latinos, other people, their frame of reference, even the, even colonized Latinos know where they came from, literally, in terms of where their foremothers and forefathers are from. They still know that information. Um, and they can, and, and everybody in the Western world can go directly to their past where they came from, except for us in terms of absolute clarity. So as a result of, what, of a domestication process, we're white codependents not by choice. I mean, right. for example, most of us only speak English. English is literally a traumatization of our spirit. The language itself is full of anti-Black implications that we use on a normal basis. And separate from that, Black people have been trained to not be human, but to be a race. We are racialized. We're the only people that say stuff like, sit your Black ass down, you Black, blanket, blank, blank, blank. White people and other people don't say sit your white ass down. They don't racialize themselves as something other than human. And again, these are not choices that we made. This is what we, we inherited. And it's important to talk about the domestication process. And I'll be brief because I want to hear from Dr. Rick. But the, the domestication is a serious word that we rarely reference to ourselves as human beings. But we have indeed been domesticated. How dogs are domesticated to be codependent to human beings and this started some thousands of years ago, if a dog or a coyote or a wolf in particular, if, if a puppy came out rebellious and was biting or resisting, they killed that puppy. The ones that were passive and wagged their tails and 
couldn't wait to see them, they were allowed to, to live. Even today, if you go to, to, to go to a dog shelter, the dogs that bark at the people that serve them food or who they put a fake hand into the cage to see if the dog's going to bite the hand or not, yeah, that dog is killed. The ones that get to live are the ones who wag their tails and be and are happy. That's what happened to Nat Turner. That's what happened to Lasante Overture. That's what happened to Winnie Mandela. A lot of people, if they step up, they're compromised. So we're living in the shadow of people who have been compromised. Now, warriors are born every day. We got two of them beyond myself right here. And then there's Aaron Magruder and there's a few others who are born anyway. But on a larger scale, the domestication process is alive and well. Their new agenda is to make us all fall in love with white folks as partners. And this biracialization that you might have seen if you watch TV, that it's hard to find two black people in love with each other in the most popular brainwashing system in this country, which is TV. And that's also to perpetuate the domestication and frankly, to use black bodies as surrogates for white supremacy. Now, if you need me to break that down, I'll do that later because I've been talking too much, but they're literally using black bodies to make up for their inability to reproduce. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, I, I totally agree. So it's, it's really um, manifesting itself in a real, it's a, a mental slavery, so to speak. That so that dependency. It's not just with just the 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 economic mechanisms and all those other things that that keep us tied to get tied into this system. But it's the mental slavery that really has the the most powerful hold over us. Um, Dr. Wallace, I'm, uh, uh, I think that the first thing that I would like to point out is that uh, in in study or in in scientific observation has this thing called statistical significance right and what statistical significance is it is a certain set point where if things can uh things are consistent beyond that point it can't be explained away by co coincidence by chance there has to be an answer for it i'm one that isn't given at all to the idea of coincidence i believe in the universal law of causality there's cause and effect if something is happening there's a reason for it happening now in statistical significance, when something starts to happen at a level that it starts to impact the whole, then we need to dis discover what the causality is because there's a negative impact that's impacting all. What uh, Dr. Monago has explained is what Dr. Naeem Agbar called the psychological chains of slavery. And basically it's the same thing, the domestication. It is, I'll take away everything, your identity, your name, your spirituality, all your values, interests, and principles, all the things you relate to, everything that you can connect to that gives you hope. That's how I enslave you. That's how I take someone in shackles, remove the shackles, and they don't leave, is that I implement a new ide ideology. I take you out of an Afrocentric awareness, and I put you inside of a Eurocentric awareness where you don't fit. So you automatically, because you don't have your own, you're looking for an identity. Your only identity is given to you within the sphere that you don't belong. So immediately you adopt an inferiority complex. Yep. Mm. And so now you want to fit in. So you do what dogs do. You become subservient. You become obedient. You become demanding. If you watch dogs, the most obedient dog will discipline the, the ones who are more radical and don't want to behave. That's how you train dogs. You take the most obedient dog and you sit up and you just leave them be they'll they, they'll do everything from potty train them to make them sit still till you get home to everything but that's the domestication and so what dr ogbar called the psychological chains of slavery dr monago called domestication it's the same thing it's taking someone putting them in an environment that they are not naturally inclined to and then saying this is where you exist and because you have no connectivity and that is the difference between every other uh group of people that have migrated to the u.s have you ever noticed that outside of whiteness mm -hmm. in the u in, in, in america the uh it tells you the power of the system and how the system is set up specifically to operate have you ever noticed that every other group outside of whites are hyphenated Asian Americans, Latin Americans, yes. Black American, African Americans, mm -hmm. everything's hyphenated. What it says is my whiteness makes me an American. Yep. And you are a subculture of my whiteness. And so therefore I I hold supremacy. Yes. And it's an idea 
that has no real true truth, but because we are what we perceive to be and we, what we accept, their, their, their power is held in place. Wow. And the whole reason that there's this division that's constantly pushed within the media, which is one of the most powerful entities available, uh, the reason that there's this constant division, like, you know, uh, the division between black men and black women, which truly, actually, I think Dr. Uh, Curry has presented a oh, great yeah. deal of evidence in, in recent in studies that show that how it's portrayed that black women don't trust black men isn't truly what it is. There's a new study now that I'm actually doing a peer review on that is presenting that uh, in large perspective, black women actually think highly of black men. Hmm. But what you get is the snapshot of everything that's wrong. Just like black on black crime. Uh, I, I, I did a write up on what I call the black on black crime myth. Is it, Does it mean that there isn't violence among us as okay. black? No, what it means is until you start discussing white on white crime, which happens at a uh, violent crime, let's say murder in particular, 84% uh, of white people are killed by other white people. It's a proximal thing. That's it has right. nothing to do with true violence. Now, the higher levels comes from de desperation and despair. You put people in hope, criminology 101 tells me if I take away your hope, I take away your ability to function, crime will go up, despair will go up, violence goes up, it doesn't matter the race. But okay. it's how we present it through media that yes. sits up and places us in that place. So I'm gonna step back, but the whole idea of that, that what I shared is, and, and, and I'm glad that he mentioned that it can easily be taken out of context, but, and I'm glad that he added context to it. And the context is this, none of the things that we're in like when I wrote Born in Captivity, Psychopathology as a Legacy of Slavery, we're talking about the robbing of our identity and that we actually see a bunch of the behaviors that are antisocial in our communities as a part of our culture because that's how it's been fed to us. That's no, right. It's not an inherent part of the culture. It's, it's a behavioral part of the culture because we've been placed in it and we've been told this is who we are. We are hyper-violent, we are hyper-sexual, and, yeah. and and all of the other negative connotations right so that's that's wow that's so that's so on point i mean we were having a a, a town hall discussion yesterday yesterday and one of the contributors made a point that we don't know who we are and when you have robbed people of their identity and stripped them away from their culture they're left to pretty much figure things out so of course when you force feed them through media propaganda through all through certain systems that are set up to tell them that they are less than, that they are other, you know, the othering of people, you know, the defaulting of whiteness to everything being good and worthiness. So that really does a number on your psychological, you know, um, uh, fortitude. Now, my question, I, I'm really interested to know what your perspectives are on the role that current that black leadership plays in this equation now we understand we understand the brainwash go ahead brother i'm black leadership please and, and you know what yes because what i was gonna yes you're right because i was going to say generally accepted black leadership <laughs> Be, accepted by who by let's say the, the mainstream the ones that are allowed the platform Did you say white what's up he can't say white yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, right. Yeah, white yeah, designated yeah. leadership. I mean, it, it, if it's not co-signed and accepted by the white mainstream, uh, then we don't see it as leadership. That's why we have a bunch okay. of failed, uh, failed movements within over the last sixty years. Is because we kept looking for replacements for Malcolm and Martin. Yes, and we got a lot of people who inserted themselves, and we still see the same thing happening right now. And I want to pass this on uh, to Dr. Monago because I think he can uh, elaborate on it a little better than me. But my thing is, when you talk about leadership, one of my most probably my most uh, repeated quotes is the greatest threat to black progress is a black face with a white agenda. Yeah. And you got to understand that these agendas are oftentimes hidden and you don't see it. You got a bunch of people who have been hollering black power for a long time and having the means through which to empower blacks but it doesn't serve them well and so you 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 get bamboozled and yeah. so uh i think that that's a great threat right now i think the the way that you actually execute leadership is through action 
I think that you have to be aware of what's going on. I think you have to have these type of discussions and I think you have to put minds together mm -hmm. that search for solutions. One of the problems that we have is because we've always been in a place of impotency is that we don't seek the answer. You can sit up and tell somebody something and the first thing they look for is a reason to tell you why it can't be done. That's right. They, they, we love to talk about the problem, but very rarely do we discuss the solution. Yeah. And so what happens is I look at people when they show up, I don't want to hear, okay, America's a racist, man. I, I was born into that knowledge. Right. What okay. Next? What okay. Doing? This is happening. That's happening. Okay. I understand that. How do we do, how do we deal with it? How do we confront it? Uh, so how do we reestablish an identity? And then I, I, I'm going to say this and I'm going to pass it on. Uh, Dr. Monago made a very clear point about the connection to heritage and the fact that if you if you follow especially uh arabs and asians are very very in tune with their heritage where they come from what they stand for their history and i've seen in situations that i know personally where if they feel their children are becoming too domesticated they will literally ship them back home to stay for a while until they get you know till they get reacclimated and understand because they don't want them completely domesticated they want them to take advantages of what is available here but they don't want them to become more attuned to being American. That's the whole group concept of assimilation. Most blacks are more in tune with being Americans than they are with the true nature of who they are as a collective. Yet they have been racialized more than any other group. I want to be American, but everybody else sees me as black before. And I even subconsciously see myself as black. That's why everything is talked about from the perspective of black. It's like he mentioned, you know, since you black, black down, all the stuff that we normally say growing up that we don't think about that no other group does is because we have no true identity. We were racialized in the beginning. So that's how we see ourselves. And then so all they have to do now in simple is create a negative image of what we identify with. Mm -hmm. So then we naturally see ourselves as inferior and we constantly try to find a way to assimilate, to be accepted. And so that goes back to the initial quote. And the initial quote was what, what the point about uh, how resentful people who assimilate are against those of us who refuse to. Right. And there's your answer. Well, well really quickly, I, I would, because there are those who are watching this and who will watch this that will say, okay, well, in those examples you gave of, you know, Arabs and, and Asians and, when they see that their kids are getting a little too domesticated, they send them back home to kind of straighten them up, you know, reconnect them with their heritage. What do you say to people, to black Americans who are here and they don't have that connection? They don't have somewhere to send their kids back to. Like, how would you address that issue? Well, first of all, from my perspective, and I hope I don't forget your question because I have to preface it with this comment. Okay. We have to be perpetually strategic at all times. We have to never not be strategic. Right. We have to always be strategic. For example, earlier you asked about leadership, and I mentioned well who who you call you know who you talking about, and then you mentioned terms like mainstream, etc. Um, we have to start. Let me preface it one more time. From my perspective, you are you've already heard me talk about this. Black people are, are in a trance. We're not fully present. We're not fully psychically stable in our in our bodies and minds. We're on automatic pilot, and the pilot is white. You know, we're not um, fully in in. We're not fully present. We're distracted and disoriented, and in a trauma trauma trance. I say that because that means that everything that the, those of us as leaders and supposedly conscious people do have to be trance breaking behavior. Mm. Trans breaking behavior is behavior that's very intentional. For example, when you talk about leadership, it's important to say um, who the leaders are and why they're leaders. Dr. Rick already broke it down, but that should be part of how we even present the questions. Like, wait a minute, um, why is this person a leader? That's right. Why are they a leader? And then we have to wait for an answer because a lot of people, we're so hopeful for a leader. We're so desperate for sometimes to see a black face doing something. So it can be the devil, but we're glad that they're there because we have this perspective of ourselves, of seeing ourselves as being lesser than, and we want to feel better about ourselves by seeing black people in white spaces. Right. So we have to actually deconstruct that. There's also some, some 
are some inadvertent mistakes that we keep making. And even as we try to advise our children, for example, one of the advices is you got to be twice as good as the white man. You've heard that before, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, that's a that's an unfinished story that sits up black people think that they're twice as inferior. The whole story is you have to be twice as good because white people are twice as corrupt. So you have mm. to let, you have to make sure they know that it's not you that's the problem. That's right. Right. And that you have to work twice as hard because of a problem in a society that we're working on, baby. I love you. That's I love your part is important. And we're working on it, but it's not because something's wrong with you, baby. It's because that's the system has these problems that I want to help you get through. So you got to work twice as hard, but not because you're twice as bad. Right. And often right. that often that part is not included in the in, in the in the narrative that we get the children. Full context is not provided. Right. So I just gave a strategic consideration in terms of how we how we deal with our children. And also, I want even though Dr. Maya Akbar made the, the, the statement he made about the slavery chain, terms like that, which are important to us as scholars, are powerful. But everyday Black people are not moved by those terminologies. But we know what domestication means. Most of us know what that means. Most of us know about domestic cattle, domestic dogs. And when I go places and speak to young people, and say that you've been domesticated, they go, what? Yeah, you've been domesticated. And when I break down what happened to Fannie Lou Hamer, who was beat almost to death because she resisted not being able to vote, and talk about Nat Turner, and except these people who could not be complacent in the midst of their disrespect, and they were and they were not domesticated enough, they get that. They go, oh shit. And then they mm. look at themselves about, am I, am I domesticated? I don't want to go out like that. Mm. Right, right. They, because they can grasp that idea. So my point is that we have to start talking to each other in ways that are that's trance breaking. We can't yeah. be all scholarly. We can't be all abstract. We that's can't right. be all academic. That, that's cute, if you will, when we're on the academic stage or when we're in an academic context that requires scholarly analysis. But most of our people don't benefit from that. In terms that's of right. that, in terms of that being the conduit for communication, we have to talk to people where they are in language that they can get. So all that to say is that when we say the terms like black leadership, we have to, we have to mention why of who I call Obama. Y'all call her Kamala Harris, but I call her Obama. We have because she's really the, the second the second coming of the of the Obama agenda. We need to talk about why she's there. As a matter of fact, yeah, I, yeah. I won a lot of money because I predicted that it was going to be Kamala who got that who got into the White House way before she was even mm. selected because I thought she might be the president. I said she's going to be the president or the vice president. It's going to happen. It's she going to be the president, though. Okay. Because she is perfectly white for the job. She's a passive white ass kissing, literally a lot of white people at home and at work. And so they right. so, so we need to stop being. But my point, though, is that we need to stop being mad at the Obamalas and understand that the Obamalas are at the other end of a marionette's line. You know what I'm saying? We'd be getting mad at the wrong people. We be getting yes. the wrong people. Yes. We be we be calling people coons and all these other kind of things as if they're independently self-hating. And then no such thing as an independently self-hating black person. They don't exist. Another thing is that there's no such thing as an accidental pattern. It was a pattern. Yeah. It's yeah. not an accident. That's why I, that's why I say Obama. Because it's not an accident that the first right. president and the first vice president are mixed, are half white. No. So we have we have to stop being abstract. We got to make black black people understand that. That's why I talk about how we talk to children. See, some of us don't want their little hearts broken. Mm -hmm. You talk in these mass ways to to it. I, I was walking down the street recently with my family in Los Angeles, and we all black, and we have a family member who was complaining about racism at their job, and they said, you know, there's this white. One. And I said, why are you whispering white? Y'all see that? Mm -hmm. before. We all black and grown. Why are you whisper? Why are you whispering? Well, I don't ask rhetorical questions, and I waited for the answer. They did not know why they were whispering because we don't self evaluate on behalf of getting out of white supremacy trance. Oh man! So I told her, I said, "You whispering white because you got what I call Cato Kalin syndrome." Now y'all might be too young to know what I mean by that, <laughs> but Cato Kalin was a white boy who lived on a multi million dollar man named O.G. Simpson's property for free in a I'm from LA I know what kind of I know what the guest house looked like right it was it was 
like a little mansion that this right. white man living in for free. And OJ wouldn't have let a black person do that. So that's why I call it Cato Kalinism because it was a white people live in our mind for free and we need to evict them. Mm. Well, we're not going to evict them until we understand that something is wrong with white supremacy. We think something's wrong with being black people. And too many times we are mad at black people. See, I'm not mad at black people for being white codependents. I have compassion for black people for being white codependents. And because That's my right. body language and my approach is, is compassion, instead of having an attitude and calling them coons, we wind up engaging each other. That's right. And through compassionate engagement, I work with them to walk out of the trauma trance because it's not our fault. We're angry about people like Obama, et cetera, but it's not even their fault. No. So, so, so all that to say is that we have to start, and I'm being redundant to make my point because I don't see it made enough, being compassionate strategists against the trauma trance and how we engage black people and how we treat black people. And we have to stop getting mad at black people. I always say being mad at black people for being self-hating is like being mad at somebody for limping after a car crash. Mm. They limp because they're in a car crash. <laughs> so we have to stop. I'm, I'm very serious about this because I see too much inner community abuse. And as right. we saw community abuse, black people go to white supremacy for sanctuary. Wow. They go into the devil's den for sanctuary because it's too painful to be around black people because it's too much misdirected rage. We're not right. we're not directing it to where, where it should be directed. Where it's supposed to go. That's right. And that's also a post-slavery behavioral phenomenon because during slavery, yeah. when we were murdered for coughing too loud, we our survival tactic was to be silenced in their presence and we, we took it out on each other. We have to talk to each other to black people understand that we don't have to keep those patterns up no more. That's kind of like so called soul food was giving us heart disease and cancer. We don't have to eat that stuff no more. We don't have to romanticize cholesterol and high blood pressure factors anymore. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I, 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 but you had I mean, a question. What was your question? <laughs> 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 you asked me a question, and I got so caught up in the preface that I forgot the question. No, you actually answered my next you question. Answered it. You answered it. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, you pretty much answered it. You know, because I was going to ask you. You know, basically, as a, a a relatively conscious person, you know, any black person who finds who considers them to to be more aware than others, it can be very, very frustrating, and that's why sometimes it kind of culminates in the the rage, the hostility, the hostility, the the cool. Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. And I'm sorry, Rick. I, I, I'm gonna shut up in a minute. Have you? Do you, have, any, do you have Do you have any children? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. Have your your, your children ever pissed you the hell off? Come. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, in your psyche, because you love them, I imagine, particularly being a conscious person, that it doesn't even cross your mind to dehumanize them just because you're you're mad at them. You never you exactly. never want to cut right you know you so that's how we have to treat all black people you we have I, to, we i'm have sorry to, brother I, I gotta i gotta say something what you just said to me is something that my father told me from for so many years and, and it, it has always stayed with me my father he's a pastor right and you know a lot of he's gone through a lot of stuff like you know in the church you know how that you know how we can be the politics of the church and I would be furious all the time. And I'm like, Daddy, why don't you do this? Why don't you do? And you know what he said to me? He said, well, Tony, how can I help them if I'm angry at them? And basically what you're saying, it's the same thing. How can you see, how can you resolve it if you cannot get past your anger? And, you know, him telling me things, something like that, it really impacted the way that I deal with my children. Me personally, I've never spanked my kids, none of them. You know, and they are beautiful, well-rounded children. They're critical thinkers. They're independent. And they don't require abuse in order to get them to do things. And I think that's also part of the legacy the legacy of slavery, where you it, feel... It, go ahead, it, go ahead, it, it definitely is a legacy of slavery. And so what you have to understand is we've literally been conditioned. I think that uh, some insight that I received... And first of all, I want to double back to the point that uh, Dr. Cleo makes about... Uh, 
being able to modernize the same statement where it actually resonates with the people it needs to reach. Uh, one of the things that my my uh, journalism uh, teacher had to teach me uh, in journalism uh, in high school was why why do we read why do we write because if you're going to be a writer you need to understand that yes you can go places with your vocabulary yes you can go places with with your ability to articulate in ways that sounds great uh but how many people actually understand it we write we write to reach that's right and when you're not speaking to reach or speaking to the people that you are trying to reach you actually alienate them yes so like i said you know i've studied uh, Dr. Arbor for uh, an unimaginable amount of time. Uh, he was very instrumental in my approach to dissecting Eurocentric psychology and then reconstructing it to fit the Black experience. But again, what Dr. Kluwe has done is actually take something that was said that actually will be insulting to most people who are actually in the, in the trenches of this experience. It's actually insulting. Take it and say it in a way that automatically incites a desire to change that's right nobody oh, wants to be domesticated that's right and 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 so the other thing about uh and and i'm one of those people like i'm always saying on my channel i never use that c word i don't even say it i never use that c word when referring to a brother now i say once i declare that a black man is absolutely not on the side of blacks that he's obviously totally jumped ship and it's about him and he he totally sides then he's fair game and even then i don't call him that word because i think that that comes from the legacy of slavery as well where i can't really go after who i really want to go after so guess who's who's going to be the recipient of yeah. my rage? Yeah. who's going to be the recipient of my rage now yeah. that's a traumatic injury that nobody wants to talk about we'll talk about all the other things that pass down as a means of trauma, but we don't want to talk about the fact that we don't address the impact of whiteness and we turn in on one another and, and, right. and we get to the point to where we're at right now. So that particular point has to be made. It has to be an understanding that I can't reach you if I alienate you. I can't reach you That's if right. you look at me and you see me being condescending or you see me as someone who thinks they're better than you. That's why when I'm discussing what's going on, I tend to use the term we a lot. Yes. Now, even though my current, my personal behavior isn't there, I'm telling you I relate to you. I'm telling you that if you're in it, I'm in it with you. Right. And I'm telling you that we're coming yes. out of it together. And that's how I see it. And the, the thing is, we saw the negative side of that forever. I grew up in a household I was reared by my great grandparents. And actually, I am old enough to remember that entire O.J. Simpson trial. But I grew up in a house with my great grandparents. I was reared by my grandmother's parents. And uh, one of the things, you, little phenomenons that you didn't pay attention to then. But when you start to be a student of human behavior, you start to go back and ask yourself why mm -hmm. and he's and dr cleo is i mean clean, painted a clear picture so i don't have to revisit it but i just want to make a point uh about how we relate and how we're racialized there's a new you know back then that's when the news came on at five and six o'clock nobody watches the news as much as they used to now it's the cn it, it's it's uh right. not so much local but everything's national and Your cable and, uh, and being yeah. social media but back then grandparents would sit down six o'clock news and they would get to the the headline story the headline story was always about crime yes and they would start talking about suspect does this and blood does this and, this. and before they can finish the story they haven't showed the picture yet my grandmother's already going law please don't let this man be black now the thing is that man has nothing to do with you he's not related to you he in no ways connected to you but you have already learned that you are associated with him whether you like it or not hmm. And people are gonna judge you based off of what he did and you've never met him. Yeah. Yeah. But that's, that, that's a, what happens when you are in a racial caste system and no one else has to defend their race? And what happens when you came out of the most dehumanizing several centuries that, that are imaginable and you won't talk about it? I mean, wow. Jews, 
and I know this, and I know you all know this, they have a mantra, it's never again. That's right. right. And their yeah. children know never again. And often our contrasting mantra is when they're going to do it again, as opposed to never again. Because mm. we are raising our children to where they don't even want to talk about that we, ha we have been enslaved and what we went through. That's a mistake. The reason the, why the Jews reference never again, because they're, refer they're referencing the Holocaust. They're telling their children, this happened to us again, and we're not going to let it happen again. What we do is very different. We say, let's ignore that, get a good job, be twice as good as the white man, go to church and play between white God, and we do all these things that keep us in the trance. Now, none of it is, none of it is intentional, but I'm just breaking down some of our norms so we can come out of the trance. And I want, to, I want to tell a short story to make this point in terms of the people watching, understanding how the trauma trance works and how being outside of the trauma trance works. And this is white folks. I was, I, I, I was asked to speak at Brown University to, to the faculty. And it's a lot, of, a lot of faculty at Brown University. And I asked the white faculty members to stand up. I said, get up, white folks. And I said it just like that, just to be dramatic and see them resist because they didn't want to get up when I talked anyway, but I put some some smell on it to make them even more, wait a minute, should I get up? But I said, get up, white folks. And the white folks got up. And there were black people in the audience as well. And I said, white folks, have you ever been to, to um, Kinko's or to Walmart or to Bank of America or to Apple and had bad service or had to bring back a product that was not working properly and they didn't give you good service. Of course, they all said yes. I said, did you say white people can't do shit right? White, white folks, they're always messing up. They just can't get it together. Did that kind of thought ever enter your mind? And the thought was so abstract, they were like, huh, what? And the, and the black folks knew where I was going that was in the audience. So they were sitting there thinking, I hope he don't, get his, he don't make us stand up. But anyway, I said, when you went to Bank of America and they overdraw drew your account by accident, did you say crackers just can't get it right? They're just going to do nothing right. And they were like, are you serious? I said, please answer the question. And they got, they said, of course not. I said, okay, sit down, white folks. I said, black people get up. And the black people were, were, were looking at each other because they were concerned about being, being oh, Lord. shamed in public, which I would right. never do. Good. Said, white folks, you can sit back down now. I'm not going to shame you in public, but y'all know what I'm thinking, right? Y'all know what's going on, right? I want y'all to know this, Black people, that even when white folks are the victims of a serial killer, they never resort to talking about white people ain't shit and getting mad at all white folks and racializing themselves. Right. But you need to understand that you learn how to racialize yourself from these people who will not racialize themselves. So right. look, look at... What's going on here? You're all accomplished members of the faculty of Brown University. So clearly you are walking examples of black genius and black capacity. So why are you still doing what I make myself conscious about when, when I ask you to stand up? And the white yeah. people just didn't know what I was talking about. This was a black conversation. <laughs> Completely <laughs> out. Of right, right. And I, and I let them know. I said, you're here because you're part of the faculty. But I came to talk to them. Mm. Not because I don't care about you, but you already know enough about who you are not to dehumanize yourself. I want to talk to my, my brothers and sisters who still need to learn that because of what your people do and have done to them. That's and, right. and then, then a, white, a white boy in the audience said, I didn't do nothing. I didn't do anything. I said, well, regardless of what you think you did or did not do, I want you to look at the difference between you and black people when it comes to behavior based on what white people benefit from and what they've done to black people that still is in existence that's right so please sit down yes yeah, yeah i was gonna say did he sit down he sat, yeah. he sat down i said because i'm not blaming it i'm not blaming it on you but i said i don't even want to get into a conversation about whether i blame you or not i want to talk to the black people who are in their mind right now concerned about you right right instead of the, each other i want the black people to be concerned about each other instead of being codependent which is, you know, the theme of this discussion. Yes. Unconsciously, if not kindly, codependent about, because some of y'all are going, oh, I hope he don't hurt him to this white boy. <laughs> oh, I hope he don't offend him for this white oh, boy. Oh, Lord. Yeah. But did you think that, did, did you worry about each other when I when, you, when I asked you to stand up? Or did you worry about Ooh. yourself? 
it was completely it was, selfish. It was in the trance breaking work. I'm you got to break the trance. That's a very yeah. good theme for this entire conversation. We have to, we got to break the trance. I, I, so here, here's the thing. Do you think that, now we understand the trance that we are in, right? No, we don't. We don't. You do. Both well, right, them. right. Not not collectively, I'm speaking. But, you know, in, in reference to the trance that we're talking about, and a lot of it, to me, is, is rooted in very low self-esteem that has been just implanted into us. Are we waiting for white people to, I guess, get a conscience and decide to say, you know what? We're going to get our, 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 our feet off of their neck. Like, what are we waiting for? Or is it just that we're just stuck in this perpetual state of how we view ourselves? Or are we waiting for them to finally say, all right, there you go, black folks. You're good now. We'll, 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 we'll kind of take the pressure off. We are. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go first because no I, I, I want him to jump on what I say and expand. OK. OK. First of all, you use the term self-esteem. And understanding self-concept, self-image, and self-esteem and how that's developed, you have to understand something. In order to have self-esteem, you have to first have a sense of self. So there's a thing called vacant self-esteem, meaning that there's no esteem at all. Mm. Now, all esteem that acquired is what you can call full, uh, full self-esteem, which is actually built off of how you perceive a particular group, let's call them white people, how you sit up and perceive they perceive you. Yes. So your whole idea of self and the esteem you give yourself isn't based off of what you see in yourself. It's what you think they see. So in that instance, you can't help but wait on them to fix your problem because you don't have a sense of self strong enough to say, I can do it myself. Mm. You're still sitting up saying they won't let me. I'm gonna pass it. I'm gonna pass it to uh, Dr. Cleo and let him let him take that. I, I I just had to put that in there. No, that's true. And and what I'm and I hope my response is responsive because when I earlier I mentioned the curriculum that our children often get, which includes you got to be twice as good as the white man, without the whole story. One thing that we are afraid to tell our children because we don't want to offend the Cato Kalin who's still taking up space in our head is that we live inside of an agenda. This is not a free, open, liberated democracy. This is an agenda we live in. We live in a white supremacist agenda. Now, people might want to find nice poetic words so we won't hurt ch children's feelings or traumatize them, but we got to tell them the truth, the truth. Yes, that, we, right. that we live in a agenda and we and you have to be twice as good, not because you're bad, but you got to be to get beyond the agenda. Because what white supremacy mythology in the trance does is it makes us evacuate our own common sense. And what I mean by that is that every time you want to see something that's amazing among human beings, all you, could, all you got to do is look to black folks. And, and you all know this. I mean, even though I have issues with the Williams sisters because they both, let me, let me get into that. I'm talking about the tennis players. Mm -hmm. they, they, they were such bad sisters. They wound up having to play each other. Mm -hmm. They had beat the whole world, literally. Right. And they had each other. They had each other. Left. That's black. And we can go on and on and on historically in a contemporary world about the phenomenality of black people, but we can't see it because we're in the white supremacy trance. And we think that if we call it what it is, we're going to offend them. Mm -hmm. And that's more important to us than offending ourselves. As a matter of fact, we've been trained through the church that to be pro-black is sacrilegious. Because I might offend mm. God who's white, and I might offend Jesus who's white. Now, I think all, all of us in this meeting know that God and Jesus are not white. That's right. But we won't tell our children that. As a matter of fact, we perpetuate that myth with Santa Claus. Hmm. And all kinds of white stuff that keeps us in the trauma trance and keep us not even recognizing what the Williams sisters did, what Tiger did, what Toni Morrison did. What the people who are working in science who are black did, what the what the Africans have done, what the people in East Africa who were called the 
Netflix have done, what Imhotep have done. I mean, we can go on and on with the stuff that we have done that's like, are you serious? We just got it going on. And the majority of the best baby scholars, I'm talking about children who, who, who go to college at, at and yeah. while, while being teens in, this, in the United States are black. That's right. That's all. Uh oh. I think also the signal. Children. Okay. All kinds, even twin babies at 12 years old, because people had more time to become wise by us because we're the first people. But but our children are calling each other the N-word. And there's no such thing on the radio as a song that's the equivalent to I'm living my best life. I'm not going back and forth with those N-words. There's no Jewish songs. I'm not going back and forth with those kikes. I'm not going back and forth with those faggots. I'm not going back and forth. We don't... You know what I'm saying? I mean, we need to understand if we understand that there's an agenda, then we'll and I literally teach a class called Watu Wajua, teaching black children critical thinking and culture affirmation. They see when when white people are doing their stuff, these people, there it is. I see the biracial agenda. I mm. see the marginalization of black people because I teach they, they could be taught as children. We have, yeah. a, we have a, at the Hamasi Center for Black. And we teach black parents how to be intentional black parents, how to teach their children to decode the world they live in. So they can see, oh, there, that's what that's what Dr. Minago or, or one of my staff, I see what they're doing. Right now, which we, we don't train them to see you can't somebody sit on choppy. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we hear you just chopping a little bit here and there. Yeah, you're chopping a little. Okay, well, where did where did Go you ahead. miss? I don't want to. No, we didn't miss anything. Just, no, oh, okay, you're coming okay. in and out. The bottom line is that we're not being honest because we're we we still have DNA level fear of white people, and fear of white backlash. I have been places. I use personal stories to make my point, so we can see how deep it is, so we can stop doing the stuff that we do. Right. Right before COVID, I was on a black mental health tour where I went to St. Paul, Minneapolis, Los Angeles, Atlanta, and some other places. And I asked the audience, among other things, I mean, a lot of things occurred, but I'm trying to get to the point. I asked the audience, did they talk to their children about police brutality, about Dylan Roof, about all these high profile assaults on black people? And that they create invitational space among their children to see how they feel about this stuff that they know about because they live on planet Earth and they and they sit in front of the TV. They know about Dylan Roof. And I ask them, did you did you ask your children? Did you check in with them? Hmm. And I ask them how they're doing and how they feel about what happened to to Trayvon Martin when that happened. And the majority of these parents, some of them who were psychologists, hadn't done that. Yeah. And, because, and that's I, no, go ahead, go ahead. Because we're trained on an unconscious basis not to offend white people at all cost, including at the cost to our own children's self love and critical thinking capacity. They didn't even think, and, and guess what happened? I'm, and I close with this that blew their minds. The boys, in particular, in the audience started crying. Mm. There's a reason why black men grow up, in, as many of us grow up, and in, in implode because we've never got permission as boys to be emotionally Emotional. authentic around how the world affects us. Right. Stop that crying, et cetera. Anyway, let me show I, I do want to kind of meet that with a, just a brief story of my own because I, like, I really relate to what you're saying. And I think, yes, we don't want to talk to our children about it. One, which is, it is rooted in not wanting to offend white people. But I also think it's also, uh, uh, I guess, a false sense of protection. It is. You want to protect your children, you know, um, even from the trauma, the trauma that you yourself have experienced. But I don't think we realize how much our children absorb. And just real brief, like my son, I remember when it was when Eric Garner was um, was murdered. Um, around that time. And then there's just a whole bunch of stuff happening. You remember when it was like, like every three months, a black guy, a black man was just getting murdered by the cops. It just, just kept happening. Well, my son 
he was around maybe five or six, maybe six years old at the time. And I remember I went to go and pick him up from school, but uh, I was late that day. So he was in the cafeteria with the teacher waiting. And I got there and I met my son there crying. He was just inconsolable. So I went and I'm like, son, what's wrong? What's wrong? And he said, daddy, I thought the police killed you. Now, that's tough. And it was at that moment that I decided, because I was one of those people that wanted to protect my son from the information that he needed. And at that moment, I decided that I was not going to hide the reality of the world from my child. And I was going to foster a sense of critical thinking within him so he can better identify these, these markers and these indicators that are out there so he can be better prepared. Yes. So now my son is 14 years old. That boy is, he's brilliant. Of course I don't he need to say anything to this kid. He identifies it. He, I, and he's not as jaded, I guess, that's the word, as we tend to be. He's not as scarred. He's learned, he's learned to separate his, he learned to, to separate his pain from who he really is. Yes. And what I usually say is we have to teach our, each other to separate our scar tissue from who we really are. And when you gave him those guide, that guidance as a baby, you prepared him to be who he is now. And he's very, very fortunate. And unfortunately, he's relatively unique. Mm -hmm. not, a lot of, not, not a lot of parents are doing that, not because they're bad people, because we have been trained to put ourselves second. If you saw the film um, about the maids, what was that film about the maids? The Help. The Help. In The Help, which, had a, which, which was very problematic, but it showed how about the time the maids got home to their children, they were too tired to be bothered. Yeah. They had spent their whole day suckling, loving, holding. The babies, white babies. Yep. Those white babies. And then when they got home, they were so tired, they were relatively abusive. And those children needed them more than them. Yes. Almost cut. Them white yes. people needed them. But that's an intergenerational phenomenon. And I'm glad that you told that story because it's going to help people in your audience understand what they need to do. Because yes. a lot of black boys have a father who told them, don't cry. So they right. cry privately. And then when he got there, they sucked it in and everything. And then they wound up acting out as a child or an adult and wind up going to jail. Yep. Because we, we, keep, we need to understand that you cannot resolve trauma in the abstract. And you cannot protect your children from trauma in a white supremacist society. They're going to be traumatized. It's guaranteed to be traumatized, but they can actually put it in context if they do what you did. Right. If your oh, children I recognize the corruption and go, oh, that's that corruption. <laughs> oh, I see it. Yes. I'm right, not right, happy. Right. If we did that, we would be easily to take out of the trauma trance and we would have less people that we resort to calling the C word. And we I've would have a stronger generation to yes, come behind us. Yes, because I've heard black children tell me or, or black former children who are now adults tell me that I went into whiteness for sanctuary from black pain. I went there for sanctuary. I got tired of N word. They call it they they, they call it N word stuff yeah. because they have no analysis. Yeah. They don't understand that the so called N word stuff is a trauma response to what these people did that you go into to for yeah. sanctuary. They yeah. don't have that analysis, but they can get it. That's what point I want to make. I've done it to too many so many black people who get it. They go, oh oh oh, I'm not going out like that. And as the model that you referenced when you wrote, read my bio, my bio called CTCA. Okay. CTCA stands for critical thinking and culture affirmation. And what critical, what, what the model does in short, because it's too complex to tell the whole thing, is that it creates a safe space with food and love and music and all kinds of ways we get black people through the door. And then once they're in the door, we ask some trigger questions to help them. We don't tell people how to think. We don't do that. We create a context where they have no choice but to go, oh shit. That's right. One of the exercises that we do Ooh, is we, yeah. ask, we ask them, name people who have contributed to human history that were not born in this country. And their whole list when the list is over is the bunch of white folks. We don't right. get mad at them. We don't get mad at them. We, we, we look at the list and we go, very quietly and lovingly, because I teach my staff to be compassionate to black people to never be abusive ever under any circumstances, never be abusive. That's and right. We, we ask them, so honey, why do you think this list is 
what it is. And we don't even say what it is. We let them look at it. Look at it. Who's on this list? And it's all white. Y'all all black. Why is, how come you don't know about people who've contributed to human history, not born in this country, who are from Africa or Cuba or Haiti? Why don't you know? Mm. And, and there's no rhetorical questions. They have to, they have to figure that and, out. And they, right. and they tell us because nobody told us. Not, not me telling them. They tell us, well, we didn't know. We didn't know. I said, well, well, why don't you know? And about it, to make a long story short, the model helps them to deconstruct hmm. their knowledge lens and where That's it right. came from and why it came from and what's wrong with it. And then the culture affirmation piece, now that they're hungry to find out stuff and they're open and they're not just in a cognitive space where, because you can tell somebody who's traumatized, don't take drugs. Well, if you don't deal with why they're traumatized, they're going to keep taking drugs regardless right. of the cognitive intellectual suggestions. So we right. get beyond the intellectual suggestions and get them to, to deconstruct themselves and, and, and figure out why they are the way they are and understand that you are at the receiving end of somebody else's inferiority complex. Yes, that's important. We call them white inferioritists, not white that, Thank you. See, that's so, oh man, it's so correct. My son has even identified that to me as a 14 year old. He says, well, dad, you know, I know people talk about white supremacy, but isn't that more of like an inferiority complex? Why they project these things onto us? This is my kid telling me this. You did it. You did it, daddy. Yeah. Back when he was five and he was crying and you checked in with him and allowed him to be a human being who had the right to be a traumatized baby boy in the midst of all these murders of black males. And you let him have that and let him engage and navigate through that. That's powerful. Right, right. Uh, talking about the theme of this particular segment is protecting our kids. One of the things I talk about a lot is the importance of holistic education. And we must learn to define education in, in the discussion as being more than the attainment of academic skills. I think that we've lost ourselves in teaching them skills. Skills prepare them to operate in the system. That's right. What we have to understand is holistic education is actually the empowerment and the pr preparation for our kids to grow up into adults who are able to go out into a world that is inherently hostile towards them and not only function, at, but thrive. And so what you have to do is you have to be honest with them. You have to show them what's out there and you have to tell them it's OK, you, especially when you're talking about black males. You, the, one of the first things you got to communicate, it's OK to feel. Yes, it's OK to say you're hurt. It's OK to cry. It's okay to express yourself because what happens is if you have the ability to cry, not crying doesn't change the fact that you are wasting a capacity that allows you to decompress. That's right. So when you're not decompressing, you're retaining. And eventually what happens is over time you're internalizing well, is you're looking good on the outside. You're saying I'm good. You're telling everybody I'm good. Your presentation says I'm good. But the mm. problem is internally you are literally, uh, self-destructing and eventually it's going to express itself overtly That's and right. then there's a problem mm -hmm. um, so the idea is to to make sure that we teach our kids how to think critically That's and right. so one of the things i constantly say on my channel is every time i come to you i'm not telling you you have to think like me i'm challenging you to think i love it when you come back to me and say i don't agree yeah now i'm just going to simply ask you why and, and from where you are drawing your conclusion. Now we're thinking, you're challenging me to think, yes. and I'm giving you the space to think, and there's no judgment. We're not talking about right or wrong answers. We're talking about, I gotta go out and figure it out. Because what happens is, you've got, what happens too? Because we're in a system that wasn't created for us, even at the beginning of school times, when you send your kid off to school, what happens? They're in an environment, especially if it's not an all black situation. If it's an all black situation, it's a little different. But if they're in mixed company, they are so afraid to be wrong with their answers, they never come up with them. Mm. So what they do is they start to pick it back off of the answers of everybody else. So now I'm defining my reality based on somebody else's perception. Dependence. And now I practice it at a level that I don't even know how to come to a conclusion on my own. So now I can't even fix my own dilemma because I'm not thinking. Mm. So the, but the idea of thinking critically is you ask a question that is that is a leading question and directed in a certain way that provokes a certain answer but you're not telling them what it is that's right but you, you you're taking away all of the 
defaults. That's you right. know, the Eurocentric idea of what is. That's right. And you're saying we're going to approach this from an Afrocentric perspective. Yes. But I'm not going to tell you that's what we're doing. <laughs> and now I'm thinking. And that's the importance. You know, you, uh, something else that we talked about is this 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 thing about cognitive awareness, this ability to understand something. And, and Dr. Cleo made a very clear point that you can be aware of something on a, on a cognitive level, on a conscious level. But what you got to understand is 96 percent of your behavior is governed by your subconscious. That's right. What's underneath that? What are you informing your subconscious of that allows it to make the decisions that govern your movements 96 percent of the time during the day? It's a bunch of people that are aware, hey, this is happening over there, but you're still holding the idea that they are controlling it. Yes. So you can know all day long that this is what you're doing to it. But if you think that they're the only one that holds the lever, you're going to always be waiting on them to release it. And those are, right. those are elements of what we teach in CTCA about the subconscious. And indeed, the subconscious running your life. And also the subconscious is where repressed stuff goes that you won't let out. The more you mm. let out, honestly, the more, the more, the, the, the less the subconscious has power to overcome your life because you have not put so much stuff there because you're being real about, about who you are. Mm. And another part about or what you've been through, another part that we talk about that this is inspired by Dr. Rich's comments is that we teach our people the difference between training and education. Education affirms you. Okay. Education enhances you. Education makes you better than you were yesterday as you are. Training trains you like a dog. And most of what happens in the school system in this country is training. It's, training. it's not education. Right. And even the Black Lives Matters movement, and I'm Matt, I'm bringing that up because of the theme of this of this discussion of white codependence. Good example. The Black yeah. Lives Matters movement, which of course white people allow to become a household word and everywhere, is a white supremacist movement because it's telling us that it's making us all say, "White people, please let us matter." White people, give us permission to matter. Yeah. That's what, because Black Lives Matter came out with murders of black people. And please let up on us. And I said, when I was on Roland Martin, I said, we need some shirts that say, don't, don't F with us. That's right. Not hands That's up. Don't mean. shoot, please. No, That's no, begging to don't, me. Don't, don't, we, we're not having it, is what our shirts should say, not BLM. And I won't get into that too much because, because that's not the main focus, but I'm talking about what we have to decode. Right. Because you asked a question right. earlier about black leaders. And people right. have made the, 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 the people who, who founded BLM black leaders. And right. I'm telling you what I know. The majority of the people who get credit for being black leaders don't even, black don't leaders. even like black people. And they, right. and they particularly don't like black men, literally. Oh, the, I mean, the majority of the people that are oh, in yeah, charge we, of- We can do a whole show on that. Right. was inspired by the murder of black men, supposedly. And they got paid and made all kinds of money inspired by the body of Michael Brown out there where he lived and all these other black people and they used us but they got used where are they now but they got i want to put it where it belongs so they got used they got paid well for it but they got used to you use us by white supremacy mythology yeah yeah because we are we are so based on what a lot of what dr rick said when i was trying to explain we're we're in this position right now of white codependence and anti-blackness where we're waiting for them to give us some more carrots instead of going into our communities and transforming our communities and making our communities better places that are safe for our hearts and for our minds. And we got to teach our young people why white people will let some let something that's black face becomes a household word. We got to be suspicious. We have a right to be suspicious. These blankety blanks enslaved us for over 200 years. We have we we should be suspicious, but not suspicious just to be caught up in suspicion, but suspicious to be proactive against the next agenda. See, we that's why I brought up the word agenda earlier. We don't want to, if you talk about your baby and you were protecting your child, and a lot of black people think they're protecting their child, but not saying that white people have an agenda, but we have to tell them. Mm. Not telling them to hate nobody or be mean and nasty too, but, but teach them to decode. Identify. Right, so they can, navigate through the society and be successful in ways that makes them not only assets to their own personal prosperity, but to black people. Right. In short, I'm going to make my point in short to, to tell you what I'm talking about that we have to reverse. The reason that 
that schools like Yale and Princeton and stuff stay in existence. Part of that is because of the alumni who continue to contribute to the organization's existence. Do you know that most HBCUs do not have any students that contribute back to the school? Mm. They don't have that same level of giving because the, those schools and I and a, and a faculty member at a very famous HBCU said this to me at a faculty meeting to my face. He said, we produce great students and we have a high graduation rate, but we do not cr create warriors for black people. Mm. This is what he said. He said, we don't create black people to, to reinvest, invest back in black power. We create great students, which means, which is why Bill and Oprah was getting so much money, that we produce hyper scholarly level assimilated black folks, yeah. even at an HBCU. So I say that because people in your audience might understand that, look, we got to teach our children to value black people at all costs and to and to devalue white supremacy and all of its elements, including Santa Claus, including white Jesus, including television, including the biracial agenda that that's goal is to teach black people not to be loyal to black people. That's what the biracial agenda is to make sure right. that, that we're not loyal to people, to each other, and that our default is not black. But our default is either confused or white. Mm. Right. That's an agenda. And if we teach our children that there's an agenda, they're less at risk to fall for it. Right. So, so yeah. I, I, so it's basically we have to learn. We have to invest ourselves in, I guess, reprogramming the way that we see ourselves and other people who look like us. Because we kind of been taught to see less than human when we look at our people or we are taught to see an enemy that we don't see a friend. We don't like, we don't like, we don't like, we don't like black people. Right. And, and that's, that's a part of the program. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a part of the program. And I think that what we have to understand, uh, as Dr. Cleo said, when we tell our children the truth, okay, there's an agenda. Now there's an awareness of the agenda. So now right. I start to recognize things and now it no longer seems like a natural part of the social, natural part of the social construct. It's more of an agenda that there are literally protocol driven uh, behaviors and situations in play that work against me. And this goes back to the beginning. If I have a sense of self, if I have a sense of identity, if I'm connected to my cultural uh, heritage, my cultural anchor uh, beyond slavery, if I understand that my history didn't begin with slavery, then I'm aware of something beyond and something greater. And now I'm aware of any time that idea of me loving me is interrupted. And then I can ask the question. One of the things we do a very uh, horrible disservice to our children with is we we stop them from asking questions. Yes. One of the most Cause dangerous I things. Because I, I say that, that right there. That right there was one of the most dangerous realities in my house. Come on. That I literally had to talk to my grandparents about the because I said so. The one thing that kids in my my kids, we have 13. And they none of them ever ever heard because I said so. You are allowed to question anything that's going on. It has yes. to be done in a way of respect, yes. and it doesn't mean it's going to change my mind. But what it does mean is I hear you. That's right, and that you have a voice, and that you have a right to speak that voice. And I have no right to to silence you because what happens is when you sit up and you silence a child, you teach them to be responsive to being silenced. Oh man! So what happens is, I, I, we by the time our children make it into high school, they are used to being told to shut up. Yes, and shut up. They have no no desire to buck the system because of the consequences that they've experienced at home. And guess yes. what, Doctor Rick? Guess what? This is important. To, I think to add to some consideration in terms of what you're saying. You mentioned earlier, and I'm paraphrasing because I don't remember your exact word, but you basically mentioned that it's important to understand that we didn't start as slavery and that we have a, ma a mighty culture and in, in experience historically that preceded slavery. But let me tell you what happens because we're in the trance. When we tell our children that we came from kings and queens and blah, 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 what they're thinking on an unconscious basis, sometimes a conscious basis is what the hell happened then? Then what happened? Because look at you now. You know, you were just blaming. 
Queens now. So on the unconscious basis, they're calling you a whole tap, or they're telling yeah. you don't don't come to with that with that black stuff, or True. you you're, you're radical because you know a lot of black people think that the opposite of pro black is anti white, which is illogical because the opposite of pro black is anti black. But being mm. anti black is not important. Being anti white is important. So we forget about having a complaint about the anti blackness. So we, we think that to be pro black is anti white. So therefore, we try to put it on the side. But we got to deal with that anti blackness, Dr. Rick, because we break down mm. what we've done. We are confused by how things are now because what black people actually did is not it's not part of the curriculum. It's not part of what pe people's knowledge base. All they see is a brother on the street begging, or right. or we don't got time for each other because we're living our best life and, and, and ain't going back and forth with those N words. So we have yeah. to, just like the unresolved recommendation of be as good as a white man, we, we got to tell the whole story or else inadvertently we become, we become either anti-black or not completely have done our job regarding getting black people out of the trance. Because yes. we're so deep in the trance, we're not impressed with what we did. I mean, we don't even right. know about Black Wall Street or Allentown or the D District in Washington, D.C. We can go on and on about the things that Black geniuses have done. We don't, we're not impressed. Right. Because mm. people are yeah. running shit. Pardon my cousin. I hope your, your, your audience ain't upset about that. Fine. But right folks are running stuff right now. Damn the pyramids. They, they are the ones who are my safety net now. And you're not challenging that. And we have to challenge that strategically, not just behaviorally or verbally, but right. our whole body and mind and, and way we show up in front of black people have to be part of how we challenge that notion. And we and we have to get we have to do more than talk about the pyramids. Right. <laughs> you know, and, and and because our children, there's a lot of black people who are thinking to themselves, well, blackness is not working. I'm gonna become an American. I'm going to become a capitalist. Oh, Damn this black stuff. And this biracial agenda is feeding into that that impulse. And that's a and that's a very dangerous impulse. This biracial agenda, Dr. Rip and, and Tony, it's the, it's it's poison to black people. I mean, it, it that biracial agenda has so many different components. First and foremost, it's an automatic anti-black sentiment in the sense that it professes especially when you notice it's right. normally a situation uh it, that that expresses itself as in i can do better if yeah. i have that and so it, it it reinforces especially when you talk about a black man with a white woman because now it reinforces another narrative that's pushed that black men don't marry i mean black I men don't marry black women I despite the fact that 89 percent of black marriages include both black and uh black men and black women but that's not the narrative push. Change, we, though. that's going to change oh it's it, it, it's already began to change there's a trend now moving towards interracial relationships because mm -hmm. they're being promoted and and and, and that, that 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 seems to be a sense of value the idea that i can now be accepted i can earn approbation by having a non-black spouse it's now ha it has a false value to it because i still believe that the white ma white man's ice is colder right so i don't see the beauty in myself whether what you know whether you like this guy or not you know wherever he falls on your thing I don't tend to pay attention to messengers. I listen to what they say and I extract the message and I ask myself, does it make sense? Uh, I don't have to like you, but if you say something that resonates with me, I'm going to acknowledge it resonates because I don't care about what, what everybody else thinks. But one of, to me, the most powerful thing that Umar Johnson ever said in his life was the most radical thing a black man can do to connect himself to the black struggle is be committed to a black woman. To me, that's where it starts. If you can't see the beauty in the black one, and I tell black men all the time when we're having this conversation, I say, let's be real, let's be transparent, let's be open. Let me tell you something, black man. Let me tell you how, how, how dark this agenda is in white supremacy. You cannot aspire to have a white woman thinking that by having a white woman you have married up without subconsciously thinking you're inferior to the white man. That's right. If you think if you think the white woman is automatically in inherently better than the black woman, subconsciously you already see yourself as inferior to the white man. How can you ever compete with him when you already see him as your superior? You have to see the beauty and the power and, and, and the uniqueness of the black woman in order to see it in yourself. 
Well, if it wasn't for the inferiority complex that the brother had, he wouldn't have even done that. The, well, the whole the whole thing is a reaction to an inferiority complex. Yeah, so, I mean, that's and whole, that's why it's important for us to, as you said earlier, we have to break the trance. We have to break the trance of this mental slavery that we're that we're stuck in. Uh, I know we're we're, we're kind of out of time. I want to you know let let you you um gentlemen uh get a final word in. Uh, I do want to say though that having this conversation with you, I think it's going to be really really beneficial to a lot of people. It's it's been actually beneficial for me because I think it's going to prepare people to better identify the everyday anti-blackness in our own subconscious and our rhetoric. You know, yes. the, the behavior is like walking down the street and you see a white person and you kind of shrink yourself a little bit to seem less intimidating. The the code switching, when you get around white people and you change the, 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 the tonation of your voice and the way that you communicate, like all of these things are mechanisms of this 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 mental slavery and this this low self esteem this this it's a as he said it's a trance this trance it, that we're in right, right. so it's a trance so I would say you know as my final thought because I want to give you you brothers the, the last word my final thought would be to mirror what you said we have to break this trance of mental slavery and we have to also eliminate rhetorical questions I love that. Dr. Monago, we have to eliminate rhetorical questions in order to to bring people, our people, to a place where they are encouraged and, and somewhat even forced to have to think. Think for yourselves. You don't have to think like me. You don't have to agree with me. You know, I always say that, you know, we have a responsibility, to, well, not only to think, but we have a responsibility to question everything that we've been taught. But and we don't have to, we don't have to agree with it or disagree, but we have to question it. Because if we don't, we are nothing more than mouthpieces for someone else's point of view. So uh, I will give the floor to uh, either one of you brothers to close this out. And I wanna thank you both for joining us. Go ahead. You're welcome. Uh, I'll go first. Uh, the thing that we have to be aware of, one of my, uh, greatest experiences and i'm an avid reader um to an extent that most people don't believe and that's another thing we have to stop we have to stop seeing black people who do extraordinary things and immediately start to try to disqualify them instead of asking them how mm -hmm. uh you know we don't question uh black into i mean white intellectuals or white academics about their credentials. We don't question them about where they learned it or how they learned it. Uh, we don't, first of all, most people don't have an understanding of what all of that means. My thing is some of my greatest uh, inspirations come from men who were autodidacts. Uh, you don't have to have that uh, institutional credential to have the level of knowledge of most uh, PhDs. And so I think that's important, but the idea of true understanding of the nature of who we are becoming, we've got to stop questioning the exception. Is, but in my reading, one of my greatest experiences was reading uh, Blackface White Mask by Franz Fanon and understanding colonization and understanding that no matter where this has happened to us in the world, there's this theme. And, and I think Dr. Cleo has given it a wonderful uh description by calling it a trance something everybody understands because when you say colonization we've used it so much and we tend to use it as a weapon so now it's insulting when we talk about psychological chains it's insulting it's and it also speaks as if okay i'm speaking from a level so far above you that you can't understand me which again is offensive but when you say a person is in a trance everybody's been in one and they know the dangers. Some some of us have been entranced by women. Some of us have been entranced by money. So, but we've all been entranced by something that didn't serve us well. And we know what it, the benefit of breaking the trance is. And so when we talk talk about that, but reading reading blackface, uh, white mask, and even Wretched of the Earth by Franz Fanon, 
opened up and it really explained the dynamics used by white society to literally bring a more superior mental set into captivity. It, it, it's, it's, if I control your environment, if I have the ability to extract from you your most precious asset, your most precious asset, which is your identity. And then if I can superimpose a willingness to aspire to be who I am, something you can never attain, I am never going to be white. I am never going to fit into that no matter how much I try. It has nothing to do with education, has nothing to do with academic achievement, it has nothing to do with financial success. It has everything to do with understanding who I am by nature, my direct connectivity to the divine and how that empowers me. But if I can take that away from you and then I can convince you that this is it over here and then you can never have it, but you're always wanting it. And then I drop you breadcrumbs. I can manipulate and control your behavior. And more importantly, I can turn you against anybody who would dare challenge you to do something different. And so what we've got to do is systematically and deliberately come up with mechanisms like the ones created by uh, Dr. Cleo. One, one that I've created is called Black Men Lead. It's a rite of passage initiative, specifically focused on young black boys from four to 13 in a rite of passage, and then from 13 to 30 in the preparation and empowerment of what true black manhood looks like through way of modeling. But in any, any scope of thing, what you've got to do is you got to take them out of the box. You got to give them permission to be outside of the box because most have been uh, conditioned under no circumstances. Do you leave the box? But what happens is not only in that situation where I'm, I'm conditioned not to leave the box by nature, I feel by thinking I'm protecting my brothers, I insist they stay in the box too. And so what happens is you got a bunch of people uh, going back to the theme of what this show is about. Most people are telling you to stay in the box, not because they hate you, because they think you're making trouble, not only for them, but for yourself. I don't want to see you crash. So I want you to get back in the box and do what these people tell you to do. And that's, that, that's traced all the way back to slavery. Massa going to get mad and everybody going to be in trouble. So you need to get over here. And, and that was always that one, that Turner. And yes. I, line, I, said, I don't care what Massa's talking about. And, and the thing is, that's the black man they want to quiet. Yes. The black man who's unapologetically black who has no problem speaking truth and calls a spade a spade. Because if that black man infects other black man with his passion for his people, there's absolutely nothing that they can do to stop it. That's, right. that's their greatest fear. These people gonna figure out who they are. <laughs> yes. I mean, that's the, I'm serious. That's their greatest fear. Oh God, they're gonna discover who they really are. And, and who, who, we, are, and who we are. Right, <laughs> right. At the same time, discover who we are and the gig is up. That's right. That's right. Right now, there is a horrible injustice occurring to people of African descent who are the most powerful war resistors against white supremacy in the Western world, and that's the Haitians. And for I always have said when I got the opportunity that Haiti should be our Israel. I mean, without the invasion of somebody else's land. I'm talking about making them sacred and making a people important. They, that should be our sake, our, 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 our Mothership. equivalent because yeah. those Africans was, were not playing and they defeated Napoleon, who I was told when I was real little was, a, was an undefeated French general. I didn't know about Haiti and Toussaint Leover too and Dessalines and the people that were over there building the citadel. Henri Christophe. And I mean, I, I've been there and I go to Haiti often, so I know a lot about it now. But as a child, I had no clue. Matter of fact, I thought they were crazy voodoo people, if anything, right. that's what I was told. But they're so profound in our history that they, I almost get moved to tears when I talk about them because I know the truth. And we don't know, we, we have no clue that those people who are suffering horrendously are still paying the price for successfully and effectively counting white supremacy to its toes. And I mention that because 
our perspective of, of Haitian people is part of the white supremacy trauma trance and the brainwashing and being trained as opposed to educated. And what Biden just did by sending them, bringing Afghans, bringing Afghans over here and providing housing and finances that we pay taxes on for the Afghans and sending Haitians back to a place where the where the leader was just assassinated. And there's, and there's clear disruption because they, they made sure it was dis, dis, disrupted. So I'm just um, deconstructing a, a, a contemporary phenomenon that's in our face that a lot of us don't realize what's going on and that we're not even clear enough to be offended by how Biden is treating those Haitian people. One of the things I want to talk about is and reiterate is the importance of language, Black people. Earlier, slavery and slavery mentality was referenced. And indeed, slavery mentality is a problem. But I don't know how many of you have been to the continent, but I go to the continent quite often, particularly Central, so-called South and West Africa. And they're going through anti-Blackness too. They're, they're judges and attorneys still dressed like, I call them RuPaul. They still got on, they got on blue blonde wigs. And that's how the, the attorneys and the judges step into court looking like George Washington with that same hairstyle that's on your dollar bill. And the official language of, of Nigeria and Ghana is English. So the white supremacy mythology trans in invasion goes beyond Africans in this country. So it's not simply a slave mentality because a lot of them were not chattels enslaved, but they are anti-Black. And the issue, in my opinion here, is anti-Blackness. The assault on Black humanity as a result of white supremacy that has been internalized into Black people is the problem. You said earlier, Tony, about somebody thinking that white people's ice is colder. Well, that's the result of anti-Blackness. Because if you go to the continent, you, they think the white people's ice is colder too, because they have been successfully invaded and domesticated, not to the extent that we have, because, because they, they don't call themselves, not let's say influenced by hip hop culture, the equivalent of the N word. For example, the word kafir. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the word kafir, but in Azania, what, that we call South Africa, the Dutch call the Africans there kafirs, which has the same epistemology or the same meaning as the N word. But because they have land and language memory, they are clear enough not to be, and they are clear enough to be insulted by the word and they don't use it. There's not an equivalent song in Azania or Africa where they say, I'm not I living my best life. I don't got time to go back and forth. They don't, they, the, the, the coffee word will never have that same life. They reject it because they have the language, culture, and land memory to re recognize an insult when they see it. Because we've been so su su successfully displaced and domesticated, we don't know an insult when we see it. So we call each other the N-word every day, even in, in so-called love and passion. We're, in, we're assaulting ourselves. So words matter. And I'm going to finish this by going down a list of everyday words that are offensive. The word people of color is offensive. It means non-white. And, and we often say people of color to not say black because we don't want to offend white people. But it's an offensive word. The Trump administration came up with the word black identity extremist. Now they're white supremacist identity extremists, but they got us, they got, they calling us for caring about black people, identity extremists. The word little white lie is offensive because that's the good lie. And they don't even waste their time coming up with words like black trash or black slavery in the late in the english language lexicon there's no such thing as the term black slavery because when you said slavery you've already covered it by default that means black people there's no equivalent to the there's no such thing as the term white excuse me black trash in the english lexicon because trash is already has, has another black of association not that have, have to put black on it but there is terms like white slavery and white lies and the, un, in, the unsaid implication, which goes into the subconscious, like Dr. Rick talked about earlier, in terms of the subconscious running our lives, all the anti-implications of these words goes into the subconscious and we implode, which includes being abusive to each other, sometimes to the point of becoming criminalized and going to jail, 
domestic violators, gang members that only kill black people, et cetera. This is how we act out all that stuff in the subconscious that's being fueled by everyday words like black on black crime. Like Dr. Rick said, in absolute terms, and when it comes to, to the numeric count, white on white crime is a, on a higher level in terms of frequency than so-called black on black crime. But the term white on white crime is not part of the English lexicon. It doesn't, it doesn't exist. Like he said, people experience murder based on proximity, based on who they with. Most Asians are killed by Asians. Most whites are killed by whites, et cetera. So I'm just breaking down words that we need to take out of our normalization of how we talk, including the N-word, including sit your black ass down. I was at a, a, a very popular department store recently where a little black boy was taking too long for his mother in terms of getting keeping up with the rest of the family. And she said, N-word, if you don't get your black ass over, I'm going to beat the black off of you. Yeah. And I told her while we were in line waiting for our stuff, I wrote a, a really nice letter to her that said a lot of stuff, but including telling her to say, don't tell your children that she's going to beat the black off of them because that implies that being black is disposable, that, mm. it, that it can be removed because of its lesser value. And like your little boy who saw the world around him because he can see, all of our children see the world around them and they're coming to conclusions without our input. And like somebody once said, if we don't educate our children, somebody else will and mm. somebody else is. And they're turning them into anti-black black people to grow up and be like Obama or Harris. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> who brought in the first first lady who's a white man, if you know what I'm saying. I mean, he's not a mm -hmm. lady. I'm talking about right, right. Position. A black woman, in quotes, did that. But our children are watching. They're watching yeah. the whole thing. And, and, and if they're watching it, and many of them are because they don't have you as a father, if they're watching it without a critical analysis, they're at high risk to be anti-Black. And that tendency is underscored by the biracial agenda of the television and all the anti-White. Even in the, And I'm going to close with this. Even in the movie that we loved, which was Black Panther, People, I mean, literally all over the world, Africans lined up, even in Ghana and Africa, to see that film. However, part of our saving grace was the CIA. I don't know yeah. if you all saw. Yeah. If you all saw Black Panther, but they had mm -hmm. a white boy who was in the CIA, who compromised Malcolm, who compromised Marcus Garvey, who who compromised the Black Panthers. They had the CIA on our Did side fighting against black people in in, in Wakanda. This is what they do to do. This is what they do to our heads. And if we have a critical analysis, our, our children go, mm -hmm, "I like the movie; it was cute and everything." But I saw what you did. Right. If our, yeah. children, if our children can do that, and they can, they have the capacity to 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 beat everybody's ass at tennis in the world and have to play each other, among other things. They can do this mm. too, but not without not with our, our guidance. We have to guide them with love. No matter how much they piss us off, we can't go, God, that fucking cool. We can't do that. We That's right. Because we give the black children permission to diss other black people more than they diss white supremacy mythology. It is easier to bring up, uh, raise uh, strong children than to repair broken men. And I think that that's why I'm always so, I'm women, very happy. And girls. And women, right, right. Yeah. I'm just speaking according to the quote, but yes. Frederick, Frederick Douglass. Frederick yeah. Douglass, yes. Yeah. So, so for me, I'm very invested in our younger generation. I'm actually quite impressed with, with this younger generation. I think they have a, a tremendous c capacity for critical thinking. And I think they're a lot braver than a lot of people from my generation who have, in my opinion, feel like we've been beaten down by, I don't know if it's time, by uh, you know just this long pattern of, I don't know, hopeless this, but it's it's frustrating. It's frustrating for me. I hope our next conversation is about that because I don't agree. I don't think these children oh. are. I don't think they're the strongest, and I don't agree with that at all. I think they have more audacity, but they're no less anti-black than the previous generation. I'm talking about Gen Z, though. I'm wanna, I want to be clear because we have like a little separation of generations. 
And next show, because we don't got time. Okay, so, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that. Be debate yeah. about that. Okay, yeah, and, I, I, and last thing, I love the fact that you said there's, there's certain words we must eliminate. I would also ask that we eliminate certain phrases from our, our mouths. Like one that I, I hate is, we ain't our grandparents because, or we ain't our ancestors. That's oh. that's how the, it goes. It's like, you think you're, you're, you're actually like fighting back or, or speaking affirmation for your people, but you're insulting them at the same time. <laughs> Even when you're-, you're But, that, but that's a part of the plan. That's they're a part of the plan. They're saying that while not even knowing history. Right. Right. Ask them, ask them who Mary Ford was and why Mary Ford was both hung and burnt alive and her baby was snatched out of her body and stomped. Ask mm-hmm. them who Mary Ford, well, they don't know. So they're talking all this stuff about they're not their grandpa. They don't know their grandfather. That's why they're saying I mean, that. Y'all could, they couldn't yeah. have handled nothing like it was going right, on back well, then anyway. My, my, my response is when I hear a kid say that, you know, obviously it's not my kid. Right. But if I hear, I hear a kid say that, I'm like, no, you're not. You're, you're, you're not your ancestors. No, okay. you're, you're exactly Definitely right. Definitely are not. You're, you're exactly right. <laughs> and, and and then I just leave it at that. What I've done is open the door. Look, you might not acknowledge it now. I, I just hit a nerve. Yes. Might, you might want to look deeper. You might want to really truly examine who they were because the thing you're able to, the fact that you're even able to sit up here and say, I'm not my grandparents or I'm not my ancestors is because they were who they were. Because a weaker people would have met their demise in totality through 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 an effort of genocide. We just can't be destroyed. And you got to understand the audacity and the tenacity of our, 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 our heritage and the fact that a weaker people could not, the very people who put us through this couldn't have gone through what they put us through. And the greatest fear is that we're going to do it to them. Yep. And so, and, and so those are the things that we need to look at. But you're on point. We, yeah, I think we need to come back and have that conversation about where this generation is. I, I agree yeah. uh, to this point with Dr. Cleo in the sense that I think they are more audacious and they they have the greater potential for radical radi- radicalization. But in the sense of being aware of who they are, they're losing touch. Uh, they, they are moving deeper into the trance of the sense of what is. And a lot of their striking back is, again, striking back at the wrong thing. They're still striking back at the ancestors instead of the system. Maybe I maybe I, I I'm thinking more so capable of retaining of 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 receiving information. Maybe that's probably a better way of phrasing it. But we'll we'll definitely discuss that the next time. <laughs> but I, once again, I appreciate having you gentlemen on. It has been my honor, and I look forward to doing this again. And to everyone Likewise. watching. Thank you very much for joining us for this episode of Community Town Hall. I'll meet, just hold on for just 20 seconds, guys, and I'll see you in the green room. And everyone, thank you.